There's a story that you'll find in all three of the Synoptic Gospels where Jesus actually gets angry at his disciples. Now, Synoptic is sometimes confusing to people. The word Synoptic is really a combination of two Greek words. One is sin, and then we're not talking S-I-N like the sin you might commit. Uh, it's the Greek word sin, S-Y-N, which means together. And the second word is optic. It's the Greek word where we get view. Uh, hence optical lenses, optics. And so it's really a combined word that means together view or the same view. Now, it's referring to the three Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These all contain a lot of the same stories, the same parables. A lot of times they follow the same chronological event order. Uh, the Gospel of John, it was written at a later date from a much different perspective. So when you hear someone say, oh, the synoptic gospels say, that means that all three of those gospels are, you know, referring or telling some story or a parable, okay? So in the synoptic gospels, now that you're also educated on the word synoptic, there's a story where Jesus actually seems upset after the disciples were unable to cast out a demon. And for me, this was a troubling passage. I couldn't understand why Jesus would be angry, especially at what appears to be a good deed. You know, you see these disciples, they're trying to cast out a, a demon, they're unable to do it, and Jesus seems really upset. You know, he's mad at the people asking him to do this. He says, you wicked and perverse generation. He tells them it's because of their little faith. He has a lot of sort of... Uh, it, there's some, something going on here that is troubling me. Every time I've ever seen Jesus get angry in the Bible, there was always some sort of righteous indignation behind it. We see him get angry when he went into the temple and there were money changers. And he was so furious, he drove them out with a whip, basically saying, you've turned my father's house into a house of commerce or a den of iniquity. Basically, whenever he's mad, there's usually a pretty valid reason. The other times we might see him mad is when he's in debates with religious leaders. A lot of times the religious leaders would be so uh, critical of people for not following the letter of the law down to the T where, you know, they're doing something like a good deed on the Sabbath. So Jesus often would even perform miracles on the Sabbath, which caused them to be really torn. They would say, well, look, he's doing this great miracle, but he's doing it on the Sabbath, so technically he's sinning. Or Jesus would argue with them that the Sabbath was not made for God, but was made for man. You know, that this is a time that it's okay to do good deeds. It's okay to do these things on a Sabbath, and they're not committing a sin by doing so. So he'd be very upset at this undue burden and undue pressure that the religious authorities would put on the population for rather meaningless reasons and not interpret the law the way it should have been from a heart and a perspective of mercy. So to compound the confusion even further is how Jesus responds after this event. You know, the disciples pull him aside and ask him in privately how come they were unable to cast out the demon. And in the three Gospels that uh, record this event, they have varying answers. In Luke, there's no mention. He doesn't basically give them any kind of solution on how to fix this. In the book of Mark, he says that this kind does not come out except by prayer. Uh, and in the book of Matthew, it says this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. So this response obviously has been the source of a lot of confusion for people who try to interpret this passage and say, well, what does it mean? Does that mean some demons you have to pray to get them to be cast out? Some do you have to pray and fast? Or is this somehow we're all looking at this situation with slightly skewed lens? Now, one of the things I learned long ago is that whenever you're reading a passage in the Bible, it's very important that you put the passage in context. And so often you'll hear people They'll recite one passage and they'll just declare it as truth by itself as if it's a standalone fact. But the problem with the Bible is often stories are told in a greater context. Like, for instance, in Psalm 14.1, it says there is no God. Now, on the surface, that would look like the Bible itself is refuting the existence of God. But if you read the full verse, it says the fool says in his heart there is no God. So you see, by adding the full verse or looking at it in its entire you know, context, we are able to clarify the bigger picture 
and these small little facts might have some clarity shown on them. Now, if you go through each of these accounts of this story where Jesus gets upset with his disciples, you'll find that each of them is preceded by a very, very specific event. It's called the Transfiguration of Jesus. Now, in this event, it's a very powerful divine moment where Jesus goes up onto a top of the hilltop and he is visited by Moses and Elijah while a few of the disciples watch and he becomes as radiant and his garments start to glow and they become almost like a, a, a glowing light. Uh, in one verse, it says it's whiter than any laundry could make it. You know, sort of they were trying to describe this as a, it's emanating like there's something very powerful happening here. And as much as this also is a confusing passage, what we often fail to do is put the greater context of this event, tying it in with why Jesus was upset. Now, back in the days when Jesus had come, there was a huge movement. There was a great expectation for a Messiah. Now, you will recount if in your earlier Bible studies, maybe, where you'll hear stories of Jesus performing a lot of miracles, or uh, you'll hear stories where maybe uh Peter and Andrew go and they cure a lame man in front of the temple. And as a result of their curing him, there was an investigation that ensued. They actually brought them before people. Witnesses were brought forward to verify that this was a true miracle. Well, what had happened at this day and time, there was a great expectation for the Messiah to be among them. And if you back up to the actual star of Bethlehem, to the time where the star appeared over the small town, Angels came to shepherds, announced the king of kings was being born. Magi came from the east with gifts. We've all seen the nativity scene where you have the, the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh brought to the baby in the manger. And we see the story really progress. We have Herod hearing about the newborn king, and he sends out his soldiers to execute every child under the age of two that's male in his land. So... Everybody in this entire backdrop has this expectation that something mighty is in the works, that there is a Messiah coming. In fact, when John the Baptist arrives on the scene, there's such a huge curiosity that could he be the Messiah? Even the religious leaders send out uh, Pharisees to go inquire with John, are you the one we are waiting for? Are you the Messiah? Now, if you re will recall John's responses, he says, no, I am not. I baptize you with water, but he who comes after me shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And he says, even to humble himself further, I am not even worthy to untie the sandals of he who follows me. So basically, he is the herald of this king who has arrived, but still there's this confusion. Who is the Messiah? There was a lot of messianic stuff going on, a lot of messianic movements that were even referred to. People thought maybe this person was the Messiah, maybe this person was the Messiah. So there was this ongoing sort of mystery as to when was the Messiah going to reveal himself. Now, the people of Israel had sort of expected a king in the, in the line of David, someone who would come and, as a warrior, throw off the oppression that they were experiencing under the, the foot of Rome. Now, a less known fact was that the temple itself and all of the religious authority of the day were actually on the lookout for the Messiah themselves. They actually had a policy in place that any time a miracle were to take place, they would go out and investigate it and try to find the Messiah. Now, in the rabbinical teachings, there were what they called the Messianic miracles. There was basically three miracles that they believed only the Messiah was capable of doing. The first of which was the cleansing of a leper. Now, leprosy has no cure. And very rarely do you see any account of leprosy being cured, even in the Old Testament. There are occasions of it. But again, the Messianic miracles are three miracles that only the Messiah would be able to do all three. That's sort of the teaching that they had. That's the belief that they had. And so what's interesting is in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, there is this story where Jesus heals a man with leprosy. And it's almost like one of the very first things that happens. The story, we look at the... Uh, version in Matthew. In Matthew 8, when Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, can you make me clean? 
And Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them, meaning a testimony to the priests. Very interesting comment. Okay, so again, here in Mark's comment, uh, after he heals the man with the epicy, and in each of these events, what's so beautiful is that the man says, Lord, if you are willing, make me clean. And in every uh, version of it, Jesus touched the man. Now, the man could have been healed with a wave of a hand, but you realize the life of a leper, it literally was hell. When a person was diagnosed with leprosy, they were basically exonerated, you know, they were taken away from their home. They were cast out of society. They had to wear a bell around their neck. Anytime people were coming near them, they had to shout out unclean. It was basically living in hell. You were in a body that was decaying. And, you know, we can't even fathom the misery someone who suffers with leprosy would feel. And the one thing that a human being would probably miss most of all is touch from another human because nobody would touch them. And here, what does Jesus do in his incredible act of compassion when he sees this person, he reaches out and physically touches him. Now, this would be such a crime if a rabbi or a Pharisee or a scribe did it because it would be making them ceremonially unclean. Just being around or touching a leper would cause them to have lost their, in essence, religious purity. But with Christ, there is nothing that can make him unclean. Only he can make others clean. And it's so beautiful because in each of these cases, he tells the person he cures, don't tell anyone about this, but go show yourself to the priests. And even in, in the book of Mark, it's so beautiful. He says, go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Again, a testimony to them. And what's interesting is we don't understand, but this was Jesus sending his calling card to the temple. This was him letting the temple know that the Messiah is among them. This is the first miracle that they're looking for. And so when he cleansed a leper and tells them to go pay your respects to the priests as a testimony to them, what he's really saying to the temple is that the Messiah is among you, that I have arrived. And this was supposed to be something kept secret. He didn't want him telling everybody across the land that he's cured him. He wanted the high priest, the actual church, to get the message first. And this is exactly what he tells the man to do. Now, the second of the three messianic miracles was the raising someone from the dead. Now, in the Gospels, we hear multiple occasions where Jesus does this. Uh, we have the famous one where he raises Lazarus from the dead. Uh, this is the one where Lazarus has been dead for days. He asks you know, that the people there watching roll away the stone. This is also the very passage where it's the shortest entire sentence in the Bible. It says, Jesus wept because he so loved Lazarus. And when he actually said, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus came out of the tomb, this was like the most popular or the most probably widely told story of his raising someone from the dead. There's also a story in the book of Mark where a synagogue ruler named Jairus, his 12-year-old daughter, uh, died. And Jesus had basically said to them, no, she's only sleeping, and went in there and told her little girl, get up, rose her from the dead. And there's another uh, account in the book of Luke where Jesus is stopped at a funeral procession as they were carrying the casket to a ceremony, and he had compassion on the weeping mother, and he told her to stop crying, then he raised her son from the dead. Okay, so in, in the Old Testament, there's also other occasions, Elijah, Elijah, the, the, you know, the second of the prophets there, they both had raised someone from the dead. And even later in the New Testament, you have uh, someone being raised by Peter, even Paul rose someone from the dead. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that the act of rising someone from the dead was a sign that you were the Messiah, but again, it was one of the three that the Messiah would be able to do, which would confirm and verify their identity. And the third of these miracles that the temple was keeping an eye out for was the casting out of a demon. Now, throughout the Bible, there's many occasions where someone casts out a demon. But what is so different about this one is that it was a specific type of demon. Now, in 
it sort of goes back to this lesson where Jesus is mad at his disciples. And we hear, how come we couldn't cast out this demon? Well, in the rabbinical teachings and the way they taught to cast out a demon is that you would try to evoke the demon's name. You know, it, the common practice was that you would try to engage with the demon, get the demon's name, and then by using the authority of God, cast it out by name. Now, we even see occasions of this where Jesus, when he crossed the water and came across the demon-possessed man, he used this method when he asked the man, what is your name? And the demon-possessed man said, well, we are legion for we are many. And so using that name, he was able to cast out the demon. But what makes this case so different is that there is a specific kind of demon that would make a person dumb. Not make them stupid, but make them unable to speak. So no matter how hard you tried to try to get the name of the demon out of the person, they were unable to get it. And so this, in essence, left a person trapped with a demon in their body, unable to get it out. And so when you see this tale where Jesus comes down and he is mad and he's seeing you angry perverse generation look it's almost like he's just so frustrated he says look i am the guy i healed the leper i raised the dead and this demon right here that i cast out did you not see me up on the hill the other night where Moses, who represents the law, Elijah, who represents the prophets, basically are testifying to my identity, that I am the one, the Messiah, the Christ, who is to come and to do these things. And here you guys are so bent out of shape on some small detail of a good deed. Now, what I find really interesting is the three types of responses Jesus gave. One, he says nothing. One, he says, to get a demon out like this, you pray. And the third, he says, you pray and fast. Now, praying and fasting is not something you do to cast out a demon. Praying and fasting is something we do to get closer to God. And I think what Jesus was really emphasizing here is that what they needed to do instead of think about the good deed they're doing is spend more time getting closer to him, to understanding who he is. You know, there's a story in... Later, as Jesus gave parables about the end times where they would be separating the sheep from the goats, you have many times where people would come and say, but Lord, but Lord, we cast out demons in your name. We cured the sick in your name. We gave sight to the blind in your name. And what does Jesus say to them? But I did not know you. And so I think what this is, the greater lesson that caused Jesus to be so upset is that he doesn't want good deeds. He doesn't want us to run around and just fill up our time with doing all these good deeds and trying to get a method for what a good deed is, but he wants us to spend that time clinging and getting closer to him, to pursue an intimate and closer, deep relationship with Christ. Because had they kept their eye on that and not on this exterior task that they were so focused on, they would have realized that the real gem that's in their presence is the fact that they're with him, the Messiah, and that he would choose to call them friend. So I leave you with this now, that Lord, whoever is listening to this, that you would instill in their heart the message that you really got frustrated with these disciples about, that it's not about all the good deeds that a person might be doing, that what you want more than that is a one-on-one -on -one relationship with each of us. You want to know us so intimately that all this exterior stuff really has no bearing. We, Our good deeds, our, our good work, all the nice things we do for other people, that's all nice, but for you, what we really need to do is focus on you and our relationship with you one-on-one. -on -one. And I pray this, and I pray that you will help everybody who hears this uh, achieve that. In Jesus' name.